whilst they were locked Senator in. Senator Sheldon, your time has expired. It being 2 p.m., the committee reports progress. Thank you. Senator Stirl. Committee reports progress. We'll move to questions without notice. Senator Ayres. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The former Commissioner of the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, David Ipp, said in relation to the Prime Minister's phone call to the New South Wales Commissioner of Police, he said, you can't see that it's information that relates to matters of state interest. It can only relate to matters of party interest. If it relates to matters of party interest, then he's using his influence as Prime Minister to try to obtain the information so that he can make the politically correct decision, that is, whether to keep Taylor or to fire him. Does the minister concede that the Prime Minister's phone call to the New South Wales Police Commissioner was inappropriate? Before I call Senator Cormann, can I remind members to use appropriate terminology? I thought I mi if I misheard Mr Taylor or the minister, rather than just the surname. Oh, okay. My, um, Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. And the answer is no. Uh, that is, I do not concede that. Uh, what the Prime Minister did was entirely appropriate. I mean, he first, he first learned in question time, as a result of a question from the Leader of the Opposition, uh, in relation uh, to uh, the matter that, uh, that the Senator is referencing, the matter that the Senator is referencing. And as it turns out, uh, the uh, police investigation uh, was the result of a, a letter from serial letter writer, uh, the uh, Shadow Attorney General D uh, um, Mark Dreyfus. In fact, he's not just a serial letter writer, he's actually a serial pest. He's a serial partisan politically motivated pest. And you know what? Order. He, he, Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, I would uh, have two points of order, Mr. President. One is I'd invite you to consider whether your request of me to rephrase my language yesterday uh, in the one of the procedural debates on this about a member of a, uh, in another place uh, are apposite here. The second is direct relevance. Uh, this is clearly not relevant to the failure, to, to, to the response to the former ICAC head, Mr Ip, and his comments about the Prime Minister. Um, on the terminology, I'll check the history of that particular phrase, and if it is, I'll come back to the chamber and ask. Um, I'm just not sure whether that's been used in Hansard before and whether it, it is. Oh, but I will ask all senators to keep in mind that it is helpful if they don't use terminology that requires me to check Hansard. Um, on the point of direct relevance, the minister had answered part of the question. I'm listening carefully, but I do consider him to be addressing other parts of the question at the moment, but I'll continue to listen carefully. Thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Let me be more helpful. Again, I, mean, I, I reject the proposition if there was anything inappropriate in what the Prime Minister did. It was entirely appropriate. I also disagree with the quote uh, that uh, the Senator has read out. It wasn't in relation to a party matter. I mean, th the question that was asked in the House of Representatives was a question that related to government. The, it, it, it was a question that related to the operations of government, to ministerial standards. And indeed, the Prime Minister made an Order. undertaking to the House of Representatives, Order. which he fulfilled. And I say it again. I mean, we've got this serial letter writer, uh, Mr. Mr. Dreyfus. And you know what? He's also a serial loser. Because as far as I can see, Sarah. every letter, Order. every reference that he's made to police or other authorities asking for investigations uh, into those on our side, not one of them has actually been successful. Not one of them. Order. Just Senator of Wong on a point of order. Point, Senator point of order. I leave the first issue to your previous ruling. The second point of order I raise is direct relevance. How is an attack on Mr Mark Dreyfus relevant to questions about the Prime Minister's criticism order. of the Prime Minister by the Independent Commission Against Corruption former chair? Okay. On, on, on the issue of language— David Ip, why don't you respond to his criticism? Order. I remind ministers that even though they have it consider themselves to directly answer part of the question, the remainder of their answer must also be directly relevant to the question. Um, so I ask the minister to um, keep that in mind as he continues his answer. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I will advise, I will inform the Senate why it's relevant, and that is because uh, this uh, investigation uh, by New South Wales Police is the result of a letter from Mr. Dreyfus, a political opponent, a politically motivated partisan, and that is he is somebody who has formed. This is part of an established pattern Order. of political smear from the Labor Party. It is part of an established Order. pattern of political smear, and I've already answered that question. 
question, Senator Long. Order, Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. This morning, former counsel assisting the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, Geoffrey Watson QC, oh, said Order the Prime Minister's right. phone call to the New South Wales Police Commissioner should or, never order, have sorry, happened. Senator Ayres, please. I can't hear Senator Ayres' question, and there may well be a point of order raised. So can I ask for silence on my right while he continues this question? He went on to say, it just looks like he's applying pressure, and it can't be anything else. It must be a favour, because why else would he be calling? How was that phone call possibly appropriate? Senator Cormann. Well, in relation to what should never have happened, you know what should never have happened? A partisan, politically motivated letter from the serial letter writer, the serial letter writer with zero outcomes, who is pursuing one political smear after the other, abusing his shadow ministerial office. That's what should never have happened. And let me tell you why it was appropriate. Because the Prime Minister was asked a question in Parliament by the Leader of the Opposition, Order by the Leader of the Opposition, in relation to the right. investigation he had no knowledge of, and he undertook to find out. He undertook to get the information. He sought the information and he reported back to the House of Representatives. That was the Prime Minister fulfilling his public duties. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. This morning, former Commissioner of the Independent Commission Against Corruption, David Ip QC, said the Prime Minister's phone call to the New South Wales Police Commissioner was not appropriate. And he said, an ordinary citizen would not be able to get that information from the police. So what is it about the Prime Minister that entitles him to that information? How is that phone call possibly appropriate? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Order. Well, uh, again, uh, we, have, we have the Labor Party initiating a partisan politically motivated smear by, sen by sending a letter to Order. New South Wales Police. New South Wales Police Commissioner on the public record has said that they are looking at it because of the position of the letter writer. The position of the letter writer. I say it again. Uh, shadow order the shadow Attorney left. General abuses his office. He's a serial order. offender. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Same two points of order. The first is the abuse of office that is alleged. I can tell you who is abusing their office. The second point, the second point, Mr. Well, and I'm happy to debate that. The second point is how is this relevant to a question which relates to criticism of the Prime Minister by the former Commissioner of ICAC? On the first point, I didn't hear that phrase. I did hear the word abuser, but I will check. There was a fair bit of noise as I was trying to call the chamber to order. Um, I would counsel everyone to be careful of using phrases like abusing office, because I will consider that to be an imputation against a member of another place. Um, on the point of direct relevance, the question said, how is the phone call appropriate? I believe it was the final phrase of it. I believe that is quite open-ended, and the minister is allowed to address that in the way that he is and be directly relevant. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. As I've already indicated to the Chamber several times now, uh, the Prime Minister uh, advised the House of Representatives on a number of occasions that as a result of the question from the Leader of the Opposition, he would seek uh, appropriate information in order to inform his judgment uh, in the context of his responsibilities in the context of ministerial standards. That's precisely what he's done, uh, and he reported back to the House of Representatives accordingly. Uh, if the Labor Party was so concerned about it, why didn't you raise this at the time when the uh, Prime Minister first informed the House of Representatives that that was what he was going to do? Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Order Can the minister left. please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is addressing real issues of importance for Australians, like creating jobs, and how the Small Business Growth Fund will support Australian small and medium businesses to invest, grow, and employ more Australians? Order. I called. I called those on my right to order during a question that was being asked of my left. I would ask the return courtesy be um, the courtesy be returned. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you uh, very much, Mr President. And I acknowledge uh, Senator Antic from South Australia's question, but I also acknowledge the former President of the Australian Senate, another great yeah. Senator from South Australia, yeah. Senator Alan Ferguson, joining us here today. Uh, Mr President, the Coalition Government on this side of the chamber, we are very proud to back small and family businesses, small and medium enterprises in Australia every step of the way, because we understand that they are the backbone of the Australian economy. There are approximately 3.4 million SMEs in Australia, 
and the contribution they make to employment and their importance to Australians cannot be underestimated. Every day, almost 7 million Australians they get up and they go to work because of the 3.4 million SMEs in Australia. And as the Treasurer himself recently said, small and medium-sized businesses are responsible for more than three-quarters of the output in agriculture and more than half the output of construction. Uh, but, Mr President, one of the issues that does affect small and family businesses and medium-sized enterprises in Australia is access to necessary capital. They often find it difficult to obtain finance other than on a secured basis, and typically what they need to do is put up the family home. They also, though, once they have actually pledged all of their real estate as collateral, and as I said, it's the family home, they find it difficult to access additional funding. Because on this side of the chamber, we are committed to putting in place the policies that will allow small and family businesses and medium-sized enterprises to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians, we have established the Australian Business Growth Fund. The government is committing $100 million in funding to the fund and is partnering with other financial institutions to provide equity funding to small and medium enterprises. We are looking forward to getting capital flowing to these businesses. Senator Antic, a supplementary question. Minister, how does this fund comp complement other measures the government is taking to support small businesses to in innovate and grow? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the government is also using our role as a procurer of services to support small and family and medium businesses, again to prosper, thrive and grow, because when they do, they create more jobs for Australians. We have clear targets for small and medium enterprises to receive 10 per cent of all government contracts and 35 per cent of contracts valued up to $20 million. The government has exceeded these targets with over 41,000 contracts valued at $16.7 billion awarded to small and medium enterprises in 2018-19. In addition, as of 1 July this year, the government is committed to paying invoices under $1 million within 20 days, and as the Finance Minister and I recently announced, as of 1 January 2020, we will start paying e-invoices within five days. Yeah. Mr President, that's backing small family and medium Order. enterprises. Senator Antic, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, why is supporting small businesses essential to the government's strong and stable economic management? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, because, as we know, when you back small and medium businesses, family businesses in Australia, they prosper, grow and they create more jobs for Australians. 3.4 million SMEs, 7 million Australians getting up every day and going to work because they are offered employment by these SMEs. We understand, though, that you need to put in place the right economic framework so that businesses are able to lever off it and grow their business. And that is why our economic plan is making it easier for small and family businesses and medium enterprises to grow their businesses. We have lowered their taxes. Why? Because we understand the more money they have, the more they're able to invest back into their business. We're cutting red tape because red tape is costly. You get rid of it, it's a return back to the business. We're, of course, giving them the opportunity to participate in our $100 billion infrastructure plan. We are committed to small, uh, supporting SMEs Order. across Australia. Senator Cash, before I come to you, Senator Keneally, while Senator Cash stole my thunder in welcoming former Senate President Alan Ferguson back to the chamber, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Alan Ferguson back to the chamber, leading the Australian Political Exchange Council's 13th delegation from New Zealand. So, on behalf of all senators, I welcome you to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate and to question time. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I refer to the Minister for Emission Reduction's use of doctored travel costs in official ministerial correspondence to the Sydney Lord Mayor, Clover Moore. Minister Taylor himself has admitted to using incorrect figures in official ministerial correspondence, forcing him to, quote, apologize unreservedly to the Sydney Lord Mayor. Does the minister endorse Minister Taylor's use of doctored travel costs from a false document 
in official ministerial correspondence. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Well, I mean, as, 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 Mr. President, firstly, as, as Minister Taylor does not endorse it. He was obviously not aware uh, when he uh, used that document that it was. He was obviously not aware. Uh, and I mean, I, I would, I would put it to you. I would put it to you. And, and that is, of course, why he has apologised once he did become aware. That is, that is, that is, of course, why he apologised when he did, when he did become aware. No one should ever use doctor documents, of course not. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Minister Taylor has told the Parliament that the document containing incorrect figures, and I quote, was drawn directly from the City of Sydney's website. It was publicly available. But the City of Sydney has provided metadata demonstrating that the only correct version of the document was ever made available on its website. Is the Minister aware of any evidence supporting Minister Taylor's version of events? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Well, again, let me just say again, nobody uh, should ever, and Minister Taylor 100 per cent agrees with this, nobody should ever knowingly uh, use uh, documents that are not, that are not uh, accurate. Nobody should knowingly use uh, documents that are, that are fabricated. Now, in relation to the ins and outs of the matters that Senator Keneally just raised, in relation to the matters that uh, Senator Keneally just raised, I refer you to the uh, statements made by Minister Taylor. Has you completed your answer, Senator Cormann? Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Has the Prime Minister sought from Minister Taylor any evidence that supports his version of events, and if not, why not? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Well, I mean, obviously, both the Prime Minister and Mr. Taylor have made statements in relation to these matters, and I refer you to those. And furthermore, we now have this letter from serial letter writer, Mr. Dreyfus, which has gone to New South Wales Police. Uh, so, New South Wales Police, as a result of Labor's uh, partisan, politically motivated actions, uh, will now uh, do its work, and that work should be allowed to take its course without interference from the Labor Party, whether here in the Senate or anywhere. Order! Order! Before. Order. Before I come to the next question, order. Before I, before I come to Senator Waters, I'd just like to clarify my point earlier with regard to the term abuse of office, reflecting on the standing orders in front of me. It is my view that someone referring to a member of another place as an abuser of office would be um, a personal reflection on a member of the other place under 1933. The phrase abuse of office, however, is an action, not a, not a personal reflection, and I think that will be very dependent upon the context in which it is used, like all language in this place. So I just thought I should clarify that, reflecting upon it at the time. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. After scandals surrounding Minister Taylor about water, about grasslands, about incorrect figures in correspondence, how long will the Prime Minister let the embattled Minister Taylor remain a minister of this government? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, <laughs> Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I'm, I, will, I thank, I thank uh, Senator Waters for that, that question. I mean, the, reason, the reason why Labor and the Greens uh, attack uh, Minister Taylor so merci mercilessly uh, is, uh, is because he's such a good minister. He's such a good minister. He's so effective at bringing down the cost of electricity. He's so effective at Order. bringing emissions down. And the Labor Party, the Greens, don't like it. They don't like it. I mean, Minister Taylor has introduced the default market offer, the price caps. He's committed. He's, of course, he's setting up the one billion dollar grid reliability fund. He's delivered a 370 million dollar investment in hydrogen and announced the national hydrogen strategy. He's put an end to dodgy discounts and light payment fees. He's implemented the a retailer a reliability obligation. He's, passed, he's been successful in uh, getting the big stick legislation passed through the parliament. He delivered the business energy uh, active program. He's advanced our gas reform package. He's established the Liddell task force. He's invested in four hydrogen and one uh, one bioenergy project. He's agreed to underwrite the New South Wales Queensland Interconnector and of course he's invested in two electric vehicle development projects. He's opened formal negotiations with the US around access to strategic petroleum reserves and there is more. I mean Minister Taylor is a hard-working, highly effective minister. The Labor Party and Greens don't like him because of how effective he is and they're just pursuing one political smear after the other to try and bring down uh, somebody who is making a fine contribution to our country. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The Prime Minister's ministerial standards expect, quote, the highest possible standards of probity, end quote. 
And yet the Prime Minister has not taken any action against Minister Taylor for any of those recent or previous scandals. Clearly those standards are either too weak or not being enforced. How long until we get a federal anti-corruption body which covers federal politicians? Good question. Senator Cormann. The supplementary. Uh, I, 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 actually, that's a, fair, that's a very tenuous supplementary uh, dealing with that. So I'll call upon the minister. I, it used the hook of the previous question to ask a substantively different question, so I'll call the minister to answer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Firstly, I reject the premise of the question. I mean, Minister Taylor is uh, a very good minister, and uh, you know, let me tell you, uh, everyone, well, everyone in this chamber, well, perhaps not everyone, everyone, uh, everyone in the parties of government uh, in this chamber should be very concerned about the proposition that a letter from your political opponents to police, in particular from a serial letter writer, a serial unsuccessful letter writer like uh, Mr. Dreyfus, that that should be the basis for a minister to be stood aside. Everyone in this chamber, on both sides of the chamber, uh, who might have the opportunity in the future to serve as a minister, should be very Senator concerned about Wilson that proposition. Wilson, on a point of order. Point of order. Senator Cormann referred to Senator Dreyfus as an unsuccessful letter writer. My understanding what was is the point Mr. Of order, Taylor Senator, wrote a letter Senator, to the mayor of Sydney, your seat. and that was. Res remove your, resume your seat. Not even a reasonable attempt at misusing a point of order, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Cormann to continue. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. In relation to the last part of the question, uh, it is well known that the government is committed to uh, bringing forward legislation to establish a Commonwealth Integrity uh, Commission, and of course uh, that will build on the very substantial uh, framework and architecture that we already have in place uh, to uh, fight corruption uh, here, here in Australia, which is highly effective. Senator Ward is a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. When will this government act in the public interest? and not its own private interest or the vested interests of its corporate donors? When will you act to clean up the stench of corruption, end the influence of dirty corporate donations and clean up democracy? Okay, Senator, Senator Waters, I counsel again that supplementary questions need to relate to the primary question. And I'll call, I'll, I'll call the I, 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 with respect, that is not related to the primary question, but I'll call the minister and give him the opportunity to answer as he sees fit. Well, um, firstly, I completely reject the premise of the question. I completely reject the premise of the question. Governance in Australia is actually at one of the highest standards all around the world. So that proposition uh, that Senator Waters, that smear that Senator Waters puts forward there against Australia and governance in Australia is quite disgraceful. Uh, and let me also, and then she talks about political donations. I mean, I seem to recall that one of the biggest ever political donations from a corporate, from a corporate donor, was given to the Greens. $1.6 million in a single donation. $1.6 million to the Australian Greens. Who was that from? Who was that from? I'm just trying to remember. Like, I mean, you are, it's just so hypocritical the way you come, in, come into this time. Senator Wong. I'm sorry, Mr. President. <laughs> My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. And I refer to the Minister for Emission Reduction's use of doctored travel costs in official ministerial correspondence to the Sydney Lord Mayor Clover Moore. When Minister Birmingham was asked in question time whether he stood by his statement on the ABC on Tuesday that, and I quote, the information was sourced from the City of Sydney website, Mr. Birmingham said, and I quote, that is the advice of Minister Taylor. Has the minister discussed this matter directly with Minister Taylor? The minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, as, as Senator Wong, if she can remember back to when she was a minister, uh, uh, would recall, ministers receive briefings from the ministers they represent and their officers in advance of estimates, in advance of question time. Now, those briefings are common practice. I'm not going to go through letter and chapter and verse of every element of those briefings, but it has been very clear and consistent all along in terms of the statement that Mr Taylor gave to the House of Representatives, making clear, as he also issued publicly, uh, that the document was sourced from the City of Sydney website. That is what he has made clear consistently, and that is what I have informed this chamber consistently. And the opposition can continue to ask the same question again, and they're going to get the same answer again, Mr President. That is what happens when you ask the same question. You get the same answer. Now, on this side, we actually want to get on with talking about issues that impact on real Australians. 
but you seem to be happy to continue to spend all of your time desperately going down political witch hunts, right. dirt digging, smearing, undertaking those activities. Well, we will make sure we spend our time getting on with dealing with electricity prices, with dealing, dealing with energy security, with dealing with creating more job opportunities for Australians. These are the things that matter. That's what we're going to continue to focus on. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Has Minister Taylor told the minister who doctored the document? Senator Birmingham. No, nobody. Mr. President, I completely reject the premise of the question because the question seeks the question seeks to rewrite the answer to the previous question. If Senator Wong had listened to my answer to the primary question, where I reinforced yet again Mr. Taylor's statements issued publicly and to the House of Representatives that the document was taken from the City of Sydney website. Mr. Taylor has, has acknowledged that there was, in the end, an error in relation to the document that was used, and that's why he's apologised to the Lord Mayor of Sydney. That's why he issued the apology, but he's been consistent all along. The document came from the order. City of Sydney Senator website. Senator Birmingham, uh, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance, and I gave the minister very many seconds to answer this. We didn't ask about the history of the document. I asked one question only. And he, this minister confirmed that he has spoken to Mr Taylor about that, this issue. I asked if the min Mr Taylor had told this minister who doctored the document. Let you, it's the only question uh, I asked. I've let you restate the question, you Senator Wong. I am listening carefully, and I do consider the minister to be directly relevant if he is talking about the document. Um, and I, the minister, to my way of listening, has been talking about the document. I don't believe he has to accept the premise of the question. But talking about the document is directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, as I made clear right at the very outset, if Senator Wong had listened to the answer to the primary question, the answer was Mr Taylor has made clear the document was downloaded from the City of Sydney website. That means that your supplementary question is invalid, Senator Wong. Senator, order, order, order. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Final supplementary. Who created the document? now demonstrated to be false. Well, who created the document? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, based on the statements that, uh, that have been made that the document was downloaded from the City of Sydney website, that obviously is a question order. that I Senator Wong, am um, not in Senator a position Birmingham to answer, on Senator a point Wong. Of order. I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong on a point of order. I'm asking about this minister's knowledge. I'm asking about this minister's knowledge who created the document. If he doesn't, if he doesn't know, he should say that in the parliament. Um, Senator Cormann on the point of order. Well, well I mean, if, if, if Senator Wong did not spend as much time uh, interjecting, which is disorderly, uh, and if she actually listened to the answer the minister was giving, he was actually making the very explicit, directly relevant point that he could not possibly be able to answer that question because it is obviously, as has been stated in the past, uh, it is a document that was downloaded from a website. So the minister was being directly responding, was directly oh. relevant and directly answering the question. We, on the point of order, Senator Wong, I'll take another submission before I rule. Thank you, Mr. President. The question goes to the minister's knowledge. I'm asking the minister to respond to that question. The question was who created the document. In, the minister is allowed to actually explain an, an alternative view of the source of the document, which is what I believe he is doing. So I think he is being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, Mr. President, let me be very clear for Senator Wong's understanding. The document, according to Mr. Taylor, was downloaded from the City of Sydney website, and Senator Wong and Senator Wong. I Order. do not Senator know Wong. who runs Senator the City Wong. of Sydney website, aside from the City of Sydney. Order. Order. Order on my left. Senators Wong and Keneally. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture. On Tuesday night this week, Channel 9 ran yet another story about PFAS contamination of livestock around defence bases. 
This time, the contamination was near RAAF-based Richmond. Can the minister assure the Senate that livestock raised in PFAS contamination zones is safe to send to market? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Senator Roberts, for your question. Um, I will have to get back with you on, on that particular issue. I haven't seen um, that particular media report. But my advice is on PFAS, um, PFAS contamination on defence. Uh, gee, it's coming in thick and fast here today. Uh, this doesn't specifically relate um, to livestock per se, but as you know, um, the contamination of Defence Force sites uh, with respect to PFAS has been an issue that the Senate committees uh, and this chamber have investigated over a, a long period of time. Uh, across the world, PFAS is used widely in a range of different industries and contamination uh, by PFAS is a global issue. We're aware uh, of it and we're acting on community concerns regarding the exposure to PFAS. Our priority is to support affected communities and to reduce their exposure to PFAS. Um, my advice is that the Defence Department is working closely with the PFAS Task Force in the Department of Environment and Energy, which has the whole of government lead in responding to this issue. So um, Angus Taylor's um, area and, and Minister Lee's area have the whole of government lead. Government action and investment to date has been extensive, including measures to support local communities uh, affected by PFAS contamination. Our government has committed substantial resource to the investigation, remediation and monitoring of, of sites and will continue to invest as required. Each site is different and so there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, and while the full cost of PFAS investigation, remediation and monitoring measures is not known, it will be significant. Uh, Defence will hold four community information sessions during December 2019 Order. to Senator present McKenzie, the findings of the our detail. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. So, Minister, you cannot advise, you cannot assure the Senate that livestock raised in PFAS contamination zones is safe to send to market. So, based on that, can you please explain why Defence has advised farmers in contamination zones to not eat their livestock meat, their vegetables and eggs, yet you say it is safe to send the produce to market. Senator McKenzie. Well, Senator Roberts, I said no such thing. I actually outlined a whole of government approach to dealing with the PFAS contamination issue uh, on defence sites. And as I said, uh, I was just getting to in my previous answer, there will be four community information sessions during December to present the findings of the detailed site investigations, the human health risk assessment reports uh, and the interim ecological risk assessment reports at the various four sites. So, Based on the knowledge and evidence available at this time, our government is not considering a land purchase program as a result of the PFAS contamination issue. Uh, with respect to the health impacts of PFAS, um, my advice is um, that questions relating to health advice or guidance should be directed to the Department of Health, um, and our government works with Commonwealth, state and territory health authorities to ensure that Order. human Senator health McKenzie, advice and guidance on PFAS— time for the answer has expired. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary Thank you, question. Mr President. I wasn't asking about land purchases. I was asking a simple question of the Minister for Agriculture. Is it safe for agricultural produce from PFAS contaminated zones to be sent to market? That's all I want to know. Senator McKenzie. Uh, there is no reason not to send uh, livestock to market from these areas. As I was trying to outline to the senator, um, the Commonwealth, State and Territory Health Authorities uh, work together to ensure that human health advice and guidance on PFAS is incorporated into PFAS environmental investigations and is known and understood by affected communities. Uh, there is ongoing consultation and communication with affected communities uh, and there is no reason uh, to actually assume uh, that there is any reason not to consume uh, produce uh, that is actually grown on these sites. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is also to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. 
Can the minister please outline how the government is addressing the real issues of importance for Australians living in rural and regional communities? Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, Senator Davey. More than seven million Australians live outside our capital cities, and the Liberal National Government backs their aspirations for a strong and prosperous future. Recently, I was able to visit the Jolliffs farm in the Riverina, a real dairy farmers whose son is finishing HSC. They're employed uh, a young farm worker there, who both of those young people want to stay on farm, work in agriculture in their local communities, despite the drought. Uh, and they're planning for their future. The number one issue that we hear about as we travel through rural and regional Australia is local job provision. That is why our side of government supports and backs our mining industry. That's why we support and back our agricultural industry now and for the next generation. Regional Australians want to ensure that their kids can access a high quality education, that geography should not be a determinant for opportunity in this country, and we are working very, very clearly towards that end. They want high-quality health care and they want connectivity of the 21st century, not just roads and rail, but digital connectivity to help them connect with the markets of the globe. And that's why we've been able to deliver a half a billion dollar stronger rural health uh, workforce pa package, where we're going to have 3,000 GPs, 3,000 nurses additional out into rural and regional Australia. It's why we've also produced, got record funding going to schools in this country and a $152 million regional student access to education program. We've got half a billion dollars in additional new funding to improve regional higher education opportunities uh, through income support and scholarship. And we've increased funding for mobile black spot programs, for SkyMaster. Uh, and a $60 million regional connectivity program to actually sustain and improve access to essential services for our rural and regional economies and also back in the industries that underpin them. Order. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister also update the Senate on what the Liberals with the Nationals in government are doing to deliver for rural and regional Australians? Senator Mackenzie. Well, your state of New South Wales has been dealing with drought for years and is now uh, faced with the ongoing threat of bushfires, Senator Davey. These difficulties are being felt right across our country as the drought continues to spread and the disasters follow. These are real issues affecting real people in regional Australia, and it is our government that is offering real and tangible support in real time. We, for those affected by bushfires, we've got the disaster recovery payment, $1,000 for eligible adults, $400 for eligible students. Uh, that is actual support going into communities right now. We've stepped up our response to the drought uh, recently, recognising that it doesn't just stop at the farm gate. We've got support for communities, uh, small business loan packages, farm household allowance expansion and simplification, rural financial counselling services and more mental health and wellbeing services in addition to $200 million drought-specific BBRF the route. Answer's expired. Senator Davey, a final supplementary and question. Finally, how are the Liberal, with the Nationals in government, ensuring that rural and regional Australia remains strong and prosperous and, importantly, is the minister aware of any alternative proposals? Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, our government is delivering real improvements in jobs, in connectivity, in health and education. These are the real issues that people out in the regions want our government to address, because we actually believe that regional Australia has a strong and prosperous future. We've been negotiating free trade agreements to, for better market access so our farmers and our miners can grow our exports and employ more people locally. We've got regional migration initiatives to ensure that our population grows and prospers, a suite of agricultural workforce solutions to make sure that we get the right people in the right place at the right time to get the crop off. But what about those opposite? They equivocate on free trade agreements when agriculture exports two-thirds of what we produce. They're promising a floor price for dairy that dairy industry doesn't want. They want to shut down the live sheep and cattle trade. They want to shut down our mines. They don't want to build a dam. Order, they're pursued, Senator McKenzie. And they're getting the their answer policies has expired. from one. Senator McKenzie. Order on my left. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Minister for the Environment. 
In the face of a worsening climate crisis, protecting our forests, the lungs of our planet, is essential to avoid climate and environmental catastrophe. They have tremendous cultural value for our first Australians. They store carbon and produce fresh water for farms and for drinking. The world has watched the Amazon being logged and burned this year at unprecedented rates, but here in Australia, in our own backyard, we continue to log and burn our forests. We are the only nation in the developed world to be marked as a global deforestation hotspot, and this logging and burning is signed off by this government through last century's regional forest agreements. Will the Morrison government commit to protecting our native forests? Or will you condemn future generations to a catastrophic climate future? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Rice for her question. Uh, our government uh, stands by our approach in terms of the modernisation of regional forest agreements. Regional forest agreements, which provide for an approach to forest management uh, through greater transparency, through outcomes-based reporting, long-term sustainability of a renewable resource in terms of uh, our forestry sector. Now, RFAs protect uh, threatened species through establishing subsequently growing and co conservation reserve system and requiring states to implement sustainable forest management practices outside of the reserve system. RFIs provide certainty to the forest industry and support the thousands of jobs associated with that industry. Our government knows that we need to create and continue to provide certainty in those sectors to make sure that those jobs are secure and sustainable as we want and expect those resources to be as well. Since RFAs were signed, Mr. President, first signed 20 years ago, conservation reserves in RFA areas have doubled. Mr. President doubled from over 5 million hectares to more than 10 million hectares in that time. This means that 50 per cent of native forests found within RFA areas are now protected within the comprehensive and adequate representative reserve system. Of the remaining native forest in RFA areas, less than 0.5 per cent of that is harvested annually. States, of course, Mr. President, are responsible for the day-to-day -day forestry operations in line with state forest management frameworks under RFAs. Uh, and indeed, RFA responsibility, order, of course, Senator is Senator uh, Birmingham, Senator Rice, on a point of order. Point of order on relevance. My question specifically went to forests and climate and the impact of logging our forests Senator on Rice, climate. Senator and Rice, the minister no, has Senator not Rice, mentioned climate re, once. Senator Rice. With respect, it would be hard for the minister to talk about forests and not be relevant to the very lengthy preamble to that question. Everything he has said, and I've been listening carefully. If, if, if senators provide, Senator Wish Wilson, while I'm ruling on the person sitting next to you as point of order, if senators have lengthy preambles of that nature, then it is much easier for a minister to be wide-ranging and directly relevant. With respect, Senator Rice, that was a long preamble, and the minister is being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. And just very briefly, then, if Senator Rice wishes in relation to climate, I would, of course, highlight to her my answer given yesterday, which points out what matters in relation to climate is what we do to meet our targets overall, not picking out sector by sector, but our commitment Order, to meeting Birmingham. our Time targets as we continuously do. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. Thanks, Senator Mr. Wish Wilson, please Thanks, be Mr. Quiet President. While in contrast to question. Senator Birmingham's response, the government will be aware that in my home state of Victoria, the state government has recently come to its senses and acknowledge that native forest logging is unsustainable, uneconomic and doesn't have the support of the community. Thousands of people are today rallying at the Victorian State Parliament in support of protecting our forests. Will the Morrison government also admit that native forest logging be belongs in the last century like sealing and whaling? Yes. Order. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, um, um, the, the Dan Andrews' government in Victoria would, uh, would probably, um, given their leanings, quite like to hear uh, Senator Rice's description that they have come to their senses. Uh, those of us on this side find there are very few occasions where we think the Andrews government ever has any sense whatsoever. Uh, Mr. President, I suspect that you may concur with that. Uh, the, Australian, uh, the Australian government, if I may, Mr. President, the Australian government was not consulted about the Victorian government's decision to end native forest harvesting 
in, uh, in state governments. I'm advised, uh, and I do note that forestry matters are handled by my good friend and colleague Senator Dunningham uh, on, uh, on a routine basis, and that his department will continue to work with the Victorian government to determine what that means for the Victorian regional forestry agreements and the process for extending those RFAs moving forward. Mr. Order, President. Senator Birmingham. Senator Rice, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Today marks half a century of export wood chipping from the native forests in southeastern New South Wales through, the through Eden, 50 years of <laughs> devastating impacts on those forests. The global market for export wood chip, native forest wood chips is at rock bottom, yet we continue to log native forests instead of meeting demand through sustainably grown plantation timbers. What is this government doing to complete the transition to a 100 per cent plantation-based timber products industry? Senator Eric. Birmingham. Order. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, what's important in this space is about operating to the sustainability practices that deliver sustainability for the forests themselves, sustainability of employment outcomes uh, for those who rely upon forestry industry, and sustainability of the resource for the long term. These are the practices that we deploy and operate to through the regional forestry agreements, working in concert and conjunction with the states and territories. When it comes to managing climate impacts, we work to that according to the detailed plan that I outlined to this Senate yesterday in terms of achieving our abatement, our emissions reduction targets that we've committed to against the very prescriptive policy measures that we took to the last election and delivering upon that and making sure that we have an integrated approach, not one that simply says we must wipe out one industry over here to meet an objective over there but one that respects the fact that we want to continue Order. to have sustainability in those industries while meeting those expired. emissions targets. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The government's Ensuring Integrity Bill proposes to introduce a fit and proper person test to apply to trade union officials. The Prime Minister and ministers have refused to provide an assurance to the parliament and to the Australian people that the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to sit as a member of the House of Representatives. Why is there one standard for the Prime Minister's mates and another for working Australians and the unions that represent them? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator thank, Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you very much, Mr President. Here we go again. Here we go again. The Labor Party coming into the, into the Senate. And Running this smear that because so because because the member for Chisholm is of Chinese origin and a proud Australian order. Chinese Senator, origin. Senator Cormann, Senator Wong on a point of order. That is, I would ask that that be withdrawn. This is not an issue of ethnicity, because the, this is not an issue of ethnicity, and asserting that it is, is a smear on us. The issue is transparency and your refusal to say she is a fit and proper person, the test you set for trade union officials. On, on this particular point, I re refer every senator to 193, the rules of debate, which also apply to um, questions, which are imputations of improper motives and all personal reflections. I will ask the minister to withdraw that for the committee of the chamber on this, uh, because I do consider that to be, given there was no mention of a nation or any such matter in the, um, in the question. If, however, I heard an interjection along those lines, um, ministers are allowed to respond to that. So I would urge all senators to be particularly careful. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I withdraw. Thank you. Uh, let, me just, let me just make this point. Let me just make this point. Uh, the, uh, the member for Chisholm uh, is a member of the House of Representatives because she was duly elected consistent with our constitution and our electoral laws and because the people of Chisholm put Order. their confidence in her to represent, to represent them here in this parliament. She absolutely is a duly and validly elected member of parliament. And just by way of context, Mr. President, just by way of context, I mean, this has been an ongoing pursuit of this particular member this particular member for some time by the Labor Party. And let's not kid ourselves. Let's not kid ourselves. I mean, the effective allegation that the Labor Party has been uh, pursuing in, in an implied and dock whistling way without actually saying it explicitly is that because she is a, an Australian order. of Chinese origin, Senator, that Senator she's a Senator Cormann on a point of order. Senator, Senator Wong on a point of order. 
Mr. President, I, re I refer you to your previous okay, ruling. My dog pre whistling and the uh, allegation that was made, they are not allegations that have been made on this side. Um, my, my, Senator Wong, my but previous— transparency. I'm happy to rule. My previous ruling was, and which the minister, sorry, my previous request, it was not a ruling which the minister kindly required, uh, 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 complied with, was in the context I thought that could have been quite easily a, a, a reflection. This, however, is a, and the terminology he is using now, is in my view a matter for debate that is not a reflection on an individual member. Um, and I think this is a, a matter that can be debated after question time or debated at another time in the chamber. The minister is not breaching a standing order with the language he's using now, and I'm listening very carefully. Senator Cormann. Are oh, you finished? So, Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. There have been a number of questions raised about the member for Chisholm in the media and a number of discrepancies in her public statements. Will the minister now assure the Senate that the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to sit as a member of the House of Representatives? Senator Corbyn. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. The member for Chisholm was pursued over membership in various organisations, of which her Labor opponent in the same election was a member of as, well, as well. Let me say, let me say it again very clearly. The member for Chisholm uh, is a duly elected member uh, for of the, in the House of Representatives, representing the, seat, representing the people of Chisholm, because, because the people of Chisholm, the majority of the people of Chisholm, voted for her, voted for her, consistent with the requirements under our constitution and under our electoral laws. And what the Labour Party is doing here is just nothing but a smear. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Prime Minister has refused to require the member for Chisholm to make a statement to the Parliament, and this morning he refused to attend the chamber to correct the record and apologise for misleading the House yesterday. Why does this Prime Minister think it's okay to have one rule for him, his ministers and his mates, but another rule for working Australians and his political opponents. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Firstly, I reject the premise of the question. I mean, the Prime Minister did misspeak yesterday, as has happened uh, from people on the other side who have had to come into the chamber to correct the record. And the Prime Minister, of course, did that at the earliest opportunity. Of course, at the at the at the earliest opportunity, I tabled the letter that the Prime Minister sent uh, to the House of Representatives correcting the record for, uh, the, information of, uh, for, the, information of, um, for the information of senators. Uh, what, is, what, is, what is happening? I mean, clearly, under Mr Albanese as the leader, we now see the Labour Party going ever and ever deeper uh, into the dirt bucket, ever and ever deeper into the dirt bucket. You have no policies, you have no policies, which is why you're going after one political smear after another, one unsubstantiated political smear after another. If you have any evidence of wrongdoing in relation to any of the allegations that you're making, bring them forward. Order. Senator o Order on my left. Order. Sen order. Senator Wong. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> My question is to the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal National Government is addressing real issues of importance to Australia's ongoing economic opportunities and security, including the recent progress to support further development? In Australia's critical minerals energy. The in Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, the Australian government has a plan to continue to grow and develop our fantastic resources industry in this country, and I recognise Senator O'Sullivan's strong support for that industry, especially in his home state of Western Australia. And the demand for our minerals continues to grow enormously thanks to the fact that in modern products there are so many different minerals that make up a smartphone, renewable energy, etc. Et and Mr uh, President, I also want to recognise the work Senator Reynolds has done in this space over many years uh, to highlight the opportunities in her home state in Western Australia. And her work, along with many others, culminated early this year with the release of the government's critical mineral strategy I launched with, uh, with Minister Birmingham. And that is focusing on the three I's uh, to grow jobs in this sector in Australia. We are focused on innovation, putting aside $25 million to invest in a new CRC for the future battery industry to grow and develop that sector of our economy. It's focused on infrastructure, building new roads, especially uh, in northern Australia, to connect up opportunities for critical minerals and to back projects like the Sheffield Resources Mineral Sands project being backed by the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility. And we're also focused on growing our investment links 
through the world to attract uh, the investment that will create the jobs here in Australia through this process. And that has taken a further step in the last few weeks with, the, with progress on the joint dialogue on critical minerals between Australia and the US. Last week I tra travelled to the US to participate in the first of those dialogue meetings. The United States has, uh, has developed a list of 35 critical minerals <laughs> critical to its economy. We can produce 14 of those very easily. Uh, and we're in extensive discussions with the US about what we can do to help meet their needs but also attract investment to Australia. While I was there, Geoscience Australia and the United States Geological Survey signed a project agreement to work together mapping the demand and, and, uh, and filling the supply. And we've committed to have further discussions next February uh, between our two governments on about how we can both meet our needs Order, to support Senator the economy. Canavan. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. Further to that, can you please explain the potential that exists for the development of critical minerals in Australia, particularly in my home state of Western Australia? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, a real opportunity in Western Australia, in particular, is rare earths. We are the second largest producer of rare earths in the world, and all of that production at this stage is located in Western Australia, in Senator O'Sullivan's home state. The thing with rare earths is they're not that rare. Uh, many of them are actually quite abundant in our earth's crust. Things like cesium is the 25th most abundant mineral in our earth's crust. But what is rare, of course, is finding them finding them in concentrations that can be developed commercially, and uh, West Australia has those opportunities. There are about 10 to 20 grams of rare earths in every mobile phone. If you've got one with you today, you won't be able when it vibrates. That's because of neodymium, praseodymium. We produce those, those minerals, and uh, companies like Linus have exciting plans to expand their production, including by developing a separation facility in the United States, which we discussed last week there. And northern minerals uh, further north in Western Australia have also got exciting plans to expand their pilot plant, which we fully back as the Australian government. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. How is the Liberal National Government continuing to support the critical minerals sector and the thousands of jobs this industry will create? Senator Canavan. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President uh, 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 before I left the United States, I announced with Senator Birmingham further developments in our critical minerals strategy. We have committed to establish a critical minerals facilitation office that will be up and running by the 1st of January th the next year, uh, and it uh, will help facilitate and attract investment from around the world. We put forward some extra funding for further research, particularly to identifying some uh, availability of rare earths or other minerals that we might not have looked at before including in things like tailings dams. There's a lot of minerals in tailings dams where we haven't processed before, but products like cobalt, which is a byproduct often of nickel production, are in great demand now for electric vehicles. So we're going to look back again at what is, does exist and what can be processed. We also announced that we're opening up Export Finance Australia uh, for investment in critical minerals, including by partnerships and <laughs> joint funding with the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility. And that's to back those opportunities in West Australia and around the country that Senator O'Sullivan asked about earlier today. Those investments will create jobs as well as help secure Order, the minerals critical Senator to Canada a modern economy. Time for the answers expired. Senator Watt. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. The minister continues to rely on Minister Taylor's statement that false travel costs used in official ministerial correspondence to the Sydney Lord Mayor were obtained from a document, and I quote, drawn directly from the City of Sydney's website. This is despite the City of Sydney having provided metadata demonstrating that only the correct version of the document was ever made available on its website. When did the minister first become aware that Minister Taylor had used doctored travel costs in official ministerial correspondence. The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. And I do reject uh, the premise of at least aspects of the question in terms of the use of the word doctored. Now, they were clearly incorrect, as, uh, as Mr. Taylor has acknowledged in his apology to the Lord Mayor of Sydney. They were clearly incorrect and he has acknowledged that. Now, in terms of awareness of the incident, uh, I would have to check, but I'm pretty sure I became aware of it uh, when it became a news story, Senator Watt. Uh, that would be when my awareness uh, was enlivened, and then I would have been briefed before being, uh, appearing either here or at estimates in relation to the handling of the matter, but those briefings would have occurred subsequent to Mr Taylor's public statements on the matter. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. 
Is the minister aware of any evidence supporting Minister Taylor's version of events? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. Taylor has made a clear statement in relation to the matter. He's made it publicly. He's made it in the House. I have no reason to doubt his statement in these matters, as you are aware, as you are aware, Senator, from the extensive questioning we've had in this place. The extensive Order. questioning we've had in this place. These matters will now, no doubt, be investigated. What I would note is you now seem, you now seem to be deciding that you will come in here and try to do the job that you've asked the New South Wales Police to do. That's what you're trying to do now, Senator Watt. Order. You are seeking. Senator, Senator um, Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. This is not about Senator Watt's motivation. It's about this minister becoming aware. I'm sorry, I won't point. On is the... he aware of any evidence supporting Minister Taylor's version of events? So, on the on the point of order, um, it is not directly relevant to talk about. Um, the person asking the question in that mode, but the minister immediately prior to that was being directly relevant because he was talking about um, an alternative version of events, I think is the fairest way to describe it, without using any of the pejorative terms that trying to avoid the pejorative terms of those asking questions. But he is allowed to outline a different version of events than that assumed by the questioner and still be directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks Mr President. As I said, Mr Taylor has made his statement. That is the statement that I've highlighted to this chamber time and time again. And that is the advice and the information I have as the minister representing to provide to this chamber. But I do, Mr President, note, note that those opposite called for a police investigation, Order, yet now Birmingham. they're trying to do it time themselves. For the answer has expired. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Given the minister has confirmed that he has discussed this matter directly with Minister Taylor, has the minister asked Minister Taylor to provide any evidence to support his version of events? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I'd suggest that Senator Watt might, uh, might wish to go and have a close look at the hand side of my answers earlier. I said that I've been briefed in relation to these matters, and I have, which is so that I can, of course, provide the information to the Senate which, as I've pointed out again and again, is based on the basis of the statements Mr Taylor has made, based on, from that, obviously, his discussions in his office in terms of the background of these matters. Now, Mr President, the Labor Party have spent pretty much all of this question time engaged in a smear exercise. Can anybody in this place remember a single policy question they've asked during this question time? No. Can anybody in this chamber think of a single question they've asked that relates to issues affecting the lives of everyday Australians? No, not one. Have they asked a single question relating to the creation of another Order job for an Australian? Right. Not one at all, because they have no care in Order, anything Senator but political Birmingham, muckraking. Senator Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Senator Payne. And, uh, I have uh, information from the Attorney General to provide to the Senate in relation to a question I was asked by Senator McKim uh, on Tuesday this week. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Attorney General advises uh, in relation to Senator McKim's answer a question: There are court orders in place restricting the disclosure of the information in this matter. Those orders were made with the consent of the parties. The Attorney General Department is assisting in the management of the information that is subject to the court orders. I note more generally that in any legal proceedings, the Attorney General or another Commonwealth representative or any other party to those proceedings can seek orders to protect sensitive information. It is always at the discretion of the court, including where parties consent, as to whether to make such orders. In considering whether to do so, the court balances competing public interests, including the principle of open justice. Thank you. Uh, Senator McKim. Uh, President, I seek leave to make a short statement of no more than one minute in response to Minister Payne's information. Leave granted. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, President. Well, what we know now is that in the 21st century there is a person who has been secretly charged, secretly sentenced and secretly imprisoned in Australia. And when asked 
in the Senate to uh, provide further information. Uh, the Attorney General's representative uh, in the Senate has uh, either uh, refused or been unable to provide any uh, further meaningful information. This is a shocking example of secrecy and abuse of state power and our descent into a police state, and yet another argument for a charter of rights in Australia. Open justice is critical to the rule of law, which in turn is critical to our democracy. There is no other reasonable conclusion to be drawn from this matter other than that we are, we are living in an authoritarian state. I have to ask what has and is order, our country coming to. Pursuant to the order adopted by the Senate earlier today, I will call the clerk to call on business.